Thank you so much for coming. I want to introduce a couple of people. Jamie Kasdorf is our assistant director at the Crisis Center, and she and I will be sticking around um, after the presentation. If anyone has any questions that they don't want to ask or maybe they're concerned about family or friends, we certainly be available to visit with you. Um, Sharon Elsie is one of our board members, and she's here today. It's just, I think everyone knows Sharon. Tamara Turhune, your dietitian, is also one of our board members. So thank you, ladies, for being here. And this is Tiffany uh, Harris. She's brand new Katie Wadi on our computers and stuff. So she's here. And her husband is the registered respiratory uh, therapist. Thank you. Well, let's talk about domestic violence. So Panhandle Crisis Center serves both men and women. I know there, today during this presentation I'm going to give a lot of examples of female victims because that's primarily who we serve. But please understand that batterers tend to act the same way, so male and female batterers both engage in the behaviors we're going to talk about today. And we do shelter men, counsel men, we have in the past, we, we certainly serve men. So we serve victims of family violence or dating violence, we serve victims of sexual assault, and we serve victims of child abuse. So, throughout the presentation today, I'm going to share with you a few stories of victims who were killed in Texas in 2016 by their intimate partners. And I think it's important to share those because sometimes we don't realize that these situations can become lethal. So this is Jesse Dobbs, a uh, Texas resident, 21 years old. In 2016, he was charged with assaulting a former girlfriend. He moved on to a new girlfriend. This is Kirsten French. Uh, she was 16 years old, and he murdered her. In 2016, he stabbed her 53 to 60 times. Um, when police responded to the home for a welfare check, they also found her 38-year-old mother and her 13-year-old sister also murdered in that home. Um, Kirsten was not there. They put out an Amber Alert. The ex-girlfriend, and other bystanders called the police to notify them that he was at a bar in Texas City, and they arrested him and they found her body nearby. So when you think about family violence and how this applies to you, um, you're here maybe because you want to learn more. Uh, most people in this room probably know someone who has been a victim of, of family violence. If you think it doesn't affect you, there are people in Perryton that have had their neighbors run to their door for the day in the middle of the night because they are so afraid that their partner is going to kill them at that moment that they run to the neighbors. So this could affect you in your own neighborhood. It could affect your children. And you may be here saying, you know, I, I am modeling a healthy relationship for my children, so how can this affect them? Well, they may be going to school with children who are witnessing family violence and experiencing the effects of that. My best friend in this world is here, Diane Harrison. And she and I did not grow up in violent homes, but in a, we grew up in a very small town. Two of our very good friends did grow up in violent homes. And we had no idea in high school because they never told us. Um, later on as, an adult, as adults, they shared with us what they went through. One friend recalls in elementary school being held hostage, she and her siblings, on the couch by her stepfather at gunpoint. He had a shotgun and the mother was outside with the police. This was a violent alcoholic home. And she says now as an adult that as a child, she thought everybody knew what was going on in her home and she was ashamed, but she also hoped that no one knew. And we never visited her home. She had 12 brothers and sisters, so it made sense to us that no one would be invited over. They had a house full, but she never wanted people to come over because she didn't know at what time her house was going to become a war zone. Our other really good friend grew up witnessing her stepdad abuse her mother. And she shared when we were adults at a time when she was a teenager, standing in her bedroom, holding a knife, standing against the wall, hearing her stepdad and mother argue, knowing it had been violent in the past, and thinking to herself with this knife, if he hits her, I have to go out and help my mom. Her stepdad was huge. The only thing that would have happened if she would have gone out was that she would have provided him a weapon to use against her and her mother. Uh, but again, we had no idea. So even friends don't always, they don't always confide, confide in us that this is going on, going on in their home. Dating partners, um, you know, your, your children may grow up seeing a healthy relationship, 
but it's easy to become involved in an abusive situation because batterers, male or female, can be charming, loving, attentive, and kind. And they can do that for quite a while in a relationship. So you, you may raise your, per, your children modeling healthy behavior, but they may choose someone and get involved in someone um, that's violent. Uh, and then, of course, the homes your children or grandchildren visit. My parents would have never sent me to those homes had they known that was going on, but no one knew. Uh, the most recent school shooting, about two weeks ago, I think now, in Maryland, was the young man who shot his ex-girlfriend and then shot another student who just happened to be a bystander in that situation. So we know it can affect us. For the people who are here that are medical professionals, um, Texas law does require that if you suspect and believe someone's injuries are due to family violence, then you're required to do a few things. You're required to inform them about the services of family of a family violence shelter nearby. You need to document that you've provided that information, and you need to document in their file your belief that these injuries were due to family violence. You also need to do another thing, which is to provide them with written information. And we have these um, outside on the table. They're in two different formats, depending on your preference. Uh, but you're welcome to pick those up and take them. They're in English and Spanish, as the statute is. So we're going to listen to a 911 tape of a child who is calling in in a home where domestic violence is occurring. This is from California. Um, and this will, then we'll talk about the effects. September 21st, 
And for some teenagers who work with my all, but for some, especially if the abuser is a step parent, you will see those kids really become very angry and frustrated with the parent that's being victimized because they don't understand why that parent will not leave, and they will actually um, lose empathy when that partner, when, when their parent is abused, because they're just fed up with living in a situation like that. So how can you help? Um, there are several different things you can do. First of all, I wish, I wish I had the magic words to tell you, if you'll just say this, um, a victim will leave, they'll get it, they'll understand. There aren't magic words. Reminding that person, if they can find in you that they're in an abusive situation, remind them every chance you get that no one deserves to be abused. Because at home, they're hearing, it's your fault, you caused me to do this, I wouldn't, you know, if you didn't make me angry, this wouldn't happen. So they're, they're being blamed. So you need to be the voice that tells them over and over again, you do not deserve this. I know you're not perfect, but you do not deserve this. No one does. Um, also, express your concern. Victims, and we're going to talk later about the effects, but victims function under a high level of denial. And when you're concerned about their safety, you need to say that. I'm worried about your safety. I'm worried. I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid for your children. They need to hear that when you really are afraid to help break through that denial. Um, also, ways you can help, know the warning signs out on that table. We have the warning signs of an abusive personality. Talk to your children at, when they, at, at an early age about this, but especially in dating relationships. Talk to them about the warning signs that someone could be abusive. And if you have single friends, um, it's very easy to, to get involved with someone who can seem very charming and charismatic and loving. <clears throat> Um, and they, they really try to involve someone quickly in a relationship. And then once they're hooked is when you begin to slowly see those signs. So those warning signs are also on our website. You can pull those up on your phone anytime you'd like to look at them. Um, it's important to know what the types of abuse are so that you can label those for victims. You guys would be surprised how many people call our hotline and say, I'm not a victim, I'm just in a bad situation, and I heard you have you know, referrals for attorneys. And, um, I said, okay, well, can you just tell me a little bit about what's going on in your relationship? Tell me what happened during your last argument. The same person that told me that they are not a victim will describe being physically assaulted, will describe emotional abuse, threats, um, yet they don't see themselves as victims because they rationalize and minimize what's going on in those situations. So as a friend or family member, you can label, when you see it's abusive, you can label it as abusive behavior. Um, also, refer them, you know, the crisis center is here to help. Our services are free. Recognize there is a level of danger as we go through, and I talk more about the people who were killed in family violence situations. It's not just the victims sometimes. It can be friends or family members as well. So recognize there's a danger there. Marital counseling is not recommended in family violence situations for a couple of reasons. The first is how likely is a victim going to be to share what's really going on and talk about it honestly with the counselor. You have to get in the vehicle and ride home with that person and maybe get assaulted that night for what you said in counseling. The second thing is batterers need to take responsibility for their behavior. But, but if they say they're going to counseling, victims do need to talk to that pastor for that counselor. They need to tell them what's really going on in that home. They can do that privately. Because you'll be surprised the number, if this, if this happens, batterers will say, I'm going to go to counseling, I want to talk to the pastor. And then the pastor will talk to the victim um, at her consent. And what you'll learn is that the person that's abusive comes in and doesn't tell anything about the real problem in that home. They'll come in and say, my wife is having an affair, and I'm just struggling with how to deal with that. And I'm hurt, and I'm upset, and help me, help me. And never will they admit the, the problem. Because it's, it's, you know, it's hard to admit that you're doing that. It's embarrassing, it's shameful. Uh, so really a batterer's program like they have in that real home. More appropriate because they do confront those moves and are in a room with other men uh, behaving that way as well. So, what is family violence? Um, just to give you a quick definition so that you know, it's a pattern of abusive behavior that's used by one partner um, in an intimate partner relationship to either gain control or to maintain control. And I always like to think of it as who in that relationship is trying to bully, intimidate, and threaten. That's just my automatic definition. And if you're looking at a friend or family member or child that's in a relationship like that, you may not see that they're being threatened. You may not see that look because you don't know it. But you can begin to look for who's trying to have control in that relationship.
relationship. So if you've got a girlfriend and she's starting to date you after a divorce maybe, and she's telling you, you know, he doesn't like it when I have these girlfriend nights out, um, but we always get in a fight when I come home about it, so I'm, I'm not going to. You, They manipulate and control. They try to make someone's life miserable and make them feel bad about the time they spend with their family and friends. And so if you're hearing that, that's a huge red flag. So physical abuse, I'm not going to read those to you. You have them in your handouts. But the point that I want to make about physical abuse is, number one, it's assaultive behavior. It's, that's something you can be arrested for. And it doesn't have to cause injury or even pain. If Diane wants to leave this room right now and we're in an intimate partner relationship and I grab her arm and I say, Diane, you stay here and talk to me. I, I maybe don't hurt her doing that, but I've committed an assault. Um, we all learned in kindergarten, you know, keep your hands to yourself, right? Well, it's kind of that same rule. I don't have to injure someone to commit an assault. Um, but violence can increase in frequency and severity. What may start out as restraining, holding down, pushing, shoving, can increase to slapping, punching, the use of weapons. A batterer, though, will only use whatever level of force is necessary. So if I can intimidate Jamie, if I can slap her once, and in this relationship, she now knows, oh, I may get hit again. I'm controlling her behavior by the, the threat of future violence. So batterers usually only use whatever level of force is necessary. When victims defend themselves and fight back, they'll raise the level of violence. Any questions about the physical abuse? Um, emotional abuse. Victims will tell you that for them, it has longer lasting effects than the physical abuse. Um, emotional abuse are those things that are meant to tear down someone's sense of self-worth, their dignity, their self-esteem. Psychological abuse, as we talk about the forms in just a second, they're, they're, they, use, they use the same tactics. The difference in emotional abuse and psychological abuse is emotional abuse affects our emotions. It makes us afraid. It makes us feel worthless. Psychological abuse actually changes our, our thoughts. Uh, it may, may make us think, I am a bad parent. I can't escape. Nothing I do will matter. It actually changes our, our mind and how we think and see the world. So different types of emotional abuse, threatening, um, one of the things you see in family violence situations quite often is false accusations. Batterers tend to be male or female, jealous people. They're very insecure and they are constantly accusing their partners of having affairs. So you'll see that um, in emotionally abusive situations. Name calling, um, name calling, threatening to harm not only the victim, but maybe threatening to harm the family pets. Um, and that can be very scary. And we do accept pets in our shelter we have an outside kill. Uh, because when people leave, they're worried about the safety of their, their pets as well. So just to give you an idea of emotional abuse, um, I worked with a lady once, and sometimes we thought, well, um, why do, what's wrong with them? Why do they stay in these situations? Do they, do they have a poor upbringing? Do they, like, what's the deal? Well, this lady was extremely bright, came from a wealthy family, uh, she had a double major in biology and chemistry and was a pre-med student. And she met her uh, boyfriend in college. They got married. She was taking time off because she had an infant child. And he became so in, so jealous and so possessive. He was just conv convinced, even with this infant child, that she was having an affair and she was doing all sorts of things in that apartment when he was gone. So he put down plastic along the carpet, like the grandma used to have in her house. He put down plastic. And he put it around the living room and the kitchen where she could walk into the kitchen for the baby's bottle and to the bathroom. But he didn't put it near the door or the window. And he would go to work and he would fix the curtains a certain way. And he would tell her he was fixing the door a certain way. And he would say, if you get off the plastic, I will know. I will know if you look throughout the curtains. I will know if you let somebody in and you're going to get it. And she was terrified. And he was just becoming increasingly jealous and, and threatening. And so she did get out of that situation, and she was lucky because she had family that immediately got her a plane ticket and, and let her um, get back to, to the end of the safety. But no one knew. I mean, they probably didn't hear any yelling or shouting in that apartment, but <laughs> the level of control that he was exhibiting was emotionally abusive. Batterers many times want to limit victim's contact with family and friends. We worked with a, a woman who reported that um, her offender would drive up in front of her parents' house 
and set a stopwatch. And that was before the days when we all had timers on our phones. You know, we didn't, we didn't have cell phones back then. He would set a stopwatch. And he would say, you've got seven minutes. You can go in and visit for seven minutes. And her role was to go in, act like everything was fine. They were just so busy that she only had seven minutes. And that way he, couldn't be, be, he could not be accused of not allowing her to see her family. And she was just supposed to put on that act that everything was okay. But she knew if she didn't get back there in seven minutes, she was going to get it. Um, emotional abuse can be breaking or striking objects, um, hitting the wall beside someone. One lady told us about sitting on the couch and she was arguing with her partner, and not the remote, but the actual VCR came flying by her head and hit the wall behind her. And you don't have to lay your hands on someone if you do that, because that sends the message, right? You better shut up or you're going to be next. So that's emotional abuse controls, threatens, intimidates on the same level as physical abuse. It just, you can't get arrested for something like that, right? Um, repeated check-ins, we had a lady that came years ago when I first started at the crisis center. She came in, she did not speak any English, she spoke Spanish. Two of us were there and neither one of us spoke any Spanish. We were on the phone trying to reach a volunteer that spoke Spanish that had a full-time job, hoping we could just at least let them connect. We couldn't reach that lady. Um, she looked at her watch and she just let, she just let us know she had to go. We got a bilingual employee. Months later, she came back and she spoke to us. And she, her husband had a job where he could call her at any time during the day. And he would. And if she wasn't home, she was going to get it when he got home. And so she knew that day that she came to us the first time that he had a meeting, he had something where he couldn't call her during that short period of time. And that was the time she just wanted to reach out and see how we could help. That didn't mean she was going to leave at that time, but she just wanted to reach out and try to get some help. So she came back and we were able to assist her. The most common threat that we hear of the victims here is, if you leave, I'll take the children. Sometimes it's the threat, I'll take them and kidnap them and you'll never see them again. I'll take them to Mexico. Sometimes it's the threat. Um, sometimes it's, they hear this over and over again. If you go ahead and leave me, you think the judge is going to give you those children? By the time I'm done with you, I'll make you look like the worst mother that ever walked the face of you. There's not a judge in this world who you can show you by the time I'm done with you. That's frightening. That is frightening for a victim. And here's an example of just that. Another woman killed in Texas in 2016. Sean Hardy stabbed and suffocated ex-wife and Christine in his home. He then hit her body in his garage. She had gone to Hardy's home to visit their five-year-old son whom Hardy had won primary custody of in a divorce proceeding. Her family reported her missing. Three weeks later, they conducted the search of his home and located her remains hidden in the garage. He was charged with murder. He had a violent history of emotionally and physically abusing her. In 2015, she sought a protective order against him after he strangled her, hit her with a gun, and tried to murder her. So, um, battered women fear this, and they do have a reason to fear this. We can tell victims you can tell your best friend, I, you, I, leave him, please, please leave him. And great, she can leave him. What are you going to do then three days later when she's served with divorce papers and she has no money for an attorney? Do you have $3,500, $5,000 to help her in this nasty custody battle? Because that's what she needs. Legal aid takes about one case a year. We, thankfully right now, have uh, grant money to provide to help with divorces and child custody cases. But when that goes away, it's scary, and Jamie has witnessed victims lose their children in court. It happens. Um, sexual abuse, I'll go back to that. Sexual abuse is forced sexual contact in the relationship. Many victims who come to us are victims of marital rape. Um, sometimes that is the actual sexual assault during the attack. Many times it's just the fact that they, they can't say no. They're coerced. Because when you're afraid, if, if saying no means you're going to get assaulted, then can you really say no? I mean, you're choosing between sex or being assaulted and then possibly raped. So that's, it's a very difficult situation for victims. Economic abuse is just trying to maintain, maintain, and maintain, maintain financial control over someone. Um, refusing to let them work. We have situations where they don't have any access to the family income at all. Their name's not on the bank account. They have to beg for grocery money. They have to beg for eyeglasses. They have to beg for things for the children because they don't have any access to money and they're not allowed to work. Um, the big threat, too, is go ahead and leave me. How are you going to support yourself? I'm not going to give you a dime of child support. Yeah, the judge can order it, but I'm not going to pay. 
Um, so that's a very scary situation for victims too because if, if they do want to leave, um, no parent wants to be able to leave and put their children in a situation where they can't provide for them. So that's many times a reason why they can stay. So why doesn't she leave? All of these reasons, I'm going to go through uh, some of those right now. And the first is about the effects of the abuse. Emotional attachment. Now, victims don't come in and tell Jamie, I'm emotionally attached to my daughter. They say, but I love him. I love him. And when he's, I just want the abuse to stop. When he, when he's nice and loving and kind, that's the person I love. I don't want to call the police on him. I don't want him to be arrested. I just want him to stop treating me this way. So we have to work through that with people in counseling. There's learned helplessness. And that's the idea when someone's subjected to something that they feel like they can't control, they can't escape, they just give up and accept their faith. And I'll tell you a story just a little bit about a situation where the lady was experiencing that. Victims use defense mechanisms, we've heard of Freud and his defense mechanisms. They deny the severity of the abuse, they deny the possibility it's going to occur again, and he apologizes and said, I promise I'll never do it. Um, they can experience displacement where they take out the anger and frustration on other people. And they, they may not take it out on the back because that's not safe, but they may yell at their best friend, they may yell at their mother, and they may abuse their children, yelling or physically abusing their children. They can rationalize the abuse, which is making excuses for it. Well, I did make him angry. He told me not to bring up his mother and I did it. You know, so it's, it was my fault too. I'm part of the problem. They may minimize it. You know, he's a big guy. He could have broken my arm. He really didn't. I, he didn't mean to hurt me when he shoved me and I fell into the glass coffee table. He didn't mean for that to happen. So they can make it seem less bad. They can obviously suffer from depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, low self-esteem, and they can engage in very unhealthy coping behaviors, some can just to cope with the stress. Smoking too much, drinking too much, or abusing prescription pills, you know, as a way to numb and, and cope with the situation. Um, I won't cover this too much because it's in your slide, but victims do, when you're looking at a healthcare setting, they utilize more healthcare services, they have longer hospital stays. So it is something in the medical field if you're looking at victims who are frequently utilizing services for things like, um, it can be frequent headaches, chronic pain, those sort of things. This 2010 study by the Center for Disease Control found that victims as compared to people who did not have a history of abuse. Um, had more issues with frequent headaches, a difficulty sleeping, um, and females had those issues. So they do have serious health consequences. So why don't they leave? Um, how many people, just raise a hand, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, but how many people have ever heard of the cycle of violence? Okay. Quite a few. That's 40 years old, um, and that theory still holds water today. And it helps when we're talking to victims, and if you have a friend or family member, you can explain this to them. It kind of helps them understand why, what, that they really are in an abusive relationship and this is what it looks like. So when a victim comes in and we talk to her and we talk about the cycle, there's the tension building phase. And that's the phase where a victim feels like she's walking on eggshells. You know, she knows violence is likely to occur. And victims have a list in their head of everything they're supposed to do. Because when they're battered, they're blamed and they're told, if you just done this, if you just kept the kids quiet, if you just had the house clean, if you just had supper on the table, I wouldn't have a reason to get mad. So they have a list. And in the tension building phase, they're trying to keep everything the way they know their batterer wants it so that the batterer won't have a reason to get angry. But batterers will use any excuse <coughs> to justify their inappropriate, unexcusable behavior. Um, one example, a lady that goes with us a lot of times to train and talk to the, the children about family violence, talks about coming home and she, she it was harvest time, she was working and she had to come home and then hurry up and get back to work. And she, she heated up the beans and everything and set it on the table and her batterer took a bite, got up, grabbed her by the hair, took her over to the refrigerator, opened the door, put her head in and just began slamming the door on her head and neck. And in his mind, and he told her that was her fault because the beans weren't warm enough. So you, you can see the justification. It's never in the batterers constantly will blame. So after the tension building phase, you move into what I just described, an acute battering incident. That can last seconds. It just takes a second to slap someone. It can last minutes. It can last hours. Or it can even last days where people are held hostage by their Phase is the honeymoon phase. And this is part of the reason why they didn't stay. Because 
This is the time when that offender, male or female, becomes the person that victim fell in love with. They're loving, they're attentive, they're very sorry, they're apologetic and remorseful for what they did. And they're saying, please don't leave me with they blood. Please come back. I promise I'll be help. I'll never get you again. I'll do whatever you want. You, I'll go, I'll go talk to the pastor, I'll still go to church again. I think I have a drinking problem. Please don't leave me now. I need your help. Please help me with this. And so that's the part where, and the victim thinks, what if, what if this time you could just change? I love this person. I just don't want to get me anymore or call me name. So that's the glue that keeps them in that uh, relationship. So, of course, hope the abuser will change. Financial concerns. Many times when victims leave, their standard of living declines. They may, they may depend on child support and if they're not receiving that. And particularly for female victims, um, it's just the wage discrepancy. Unless they're a professional woman, they may not really be making enough to really support their family without the help of child support. So that's really tough. When we serve male victims, you know, sometimes for genuine <coughs> Good, you know, because this person has a good job. If they want to get an attorney, if they've reached that point, they have the money to do that. So they're still suffering the effects, the men are who are victims, but they have more access financially um, to, to remove some of those obstacles victims face when leaving. Um, men sometimes don't leave because they fear they won't get custody of the children. They fear they won't be the lead and they won't get custody of the children. Um, same issue as women have. Religion, many times people's religious beliefs keeps victims in abusive situations. Um, and sometimes it's the family ex expectations that you got married, you stay married, we don't support you divorcing this person. And the family may not even really know and see what's going on in that home. Because to the outward society, batterers look like nice people. You know, they don't typically act like that in public. Um, they're experiencing the impact of psychological trauma. The history of abuse is important because I want you to think of something, and we serve the victims who fit this criteria. They have been abused as children. They have been sexually abused. Um, they've been sent the message from a very early age that their bodies don't matter. They're not worth anything. They've been given that message. Then if they, they're, they're very vulnerable, and of course, batterer is going to target that type of person. But when they end up in that relationship, that relationship actually may be better than their childhood situation. So all of these factors play into decision making. And then of course immigration status and we do have resources at the center to help undocumented victims obtain legal residency uh, in some cases. Um, and fear, fear is a big one. So I'm not going to cover these, just a few. Um, sometimes victims lack emotional support and family members and friends can get so frustrated that sometimes they pull away because they watch a victim leave and go back, leave and go back. And then they just finally say, that's it, we're done. Just don't call me again, I'm tired of hearing this. And then the battle wins because then they really don't have that emotional support. So if you can hang in there with them, please do. Um, and then the, the belief that they, they're the only one that can help this abuser. And I've seen victims go back because batters use the emotional, um, abusive behavior of saying, if you, if, I'll kill myself. I don't have any, any reason to live if you don't come back to me. Now, can you imagine a mother of two or three children who thinks, what am I going to tell my children if this abuser kills themselves? Uh, it's going to be my fault. That's what they, the victim thinks if I don't go back. So that's a very manipulative um, form of abuse. And then it's not just fear of the children and, and their safety during visitation, that's sometimes it. But sometimes it's just, well, how are my children um, going to cope with the boys? You will have victims tell us he's a really good parent. Now, I would argue with that. The male or female is the batterer. Uh, because battering is a parenting choice. And when you're mm -hmm. abusing another parent and those children are in that home, they hear it, they know about it, that's abusing those children. So, just a few stories, the myth versus the reality of leaving. We say, we you know, this is the best thing, your life will be so much better. Well, uh, I worked with a lady once who did everything you would ask someone to do. She had tried in her marriage. She had been married almost 20 years. Um, physical abuse, but a lot, a lot more emotional abuse. She finally left. She went to a shelter. She got a protective order. She found subsidized housing, and she enrolled in college. I mean, check, check, check. Way to go, lady. She moved 30 to 45 miles away from where she used to live. But guess what? Her batterer drove almost every night to her new town to drive by the street, to sit in the apartment complex parking lot, just so she'd know he's there and he's watching her. 
she would call the police and she would say, you know, I have a protective order. Can't you do anything? He doesn't even live in this town. They would say, we're sorry. You know, now, if he comes up and knocks on the door, he's invited. He can drive down your street. He can sit in the parking lot. We're sorry. That woman slept, not in the bed in her new home, but on the floor with the, the phone, the telephone. This was before cell phones. She had the phone cord stretched out. She had the phone beside her, and she had a hammer beside her. And she said, you know, one night he's not going to be satisfied with just, just sitting in the vehicle out there. He's going to be so mad that he's going to come up and break in. And the only chance I have is he's going to think I'm on the bed. He's going to expect me to be on the bed. But I'm going to be on the floor. I'm going to hear him. I'm going to jump up, hit him over the head with the hammer, and dial 911. And that is how that woman lived for a period of months, terrified, until he kidnapped their young son. Another fear and threat followed through with. And that's what finally got him in enough trouble that she could have a few months of peace. But she would tell you, she, and she told me, life didn't get better after we got to work. Because at least when I was with him, there were good days and bad. He wasn't mean all the time. But the minute I left, he was angry at me every second. And I spent every second looking over my shoulder. So we have to realize it's not easy to leave. Um, this is, a, at the end, I'll talk about the learned helplessness with this woman. This woman left, got a protective order. Um, he, was, he was violating that protective order right and left. And she had such low self-esteem. And she would say, I don't want, you know, I'm just bothering the police. I know they're just sick of me. Like, they don't, you know, I just, they've got more important things to do. And we would tell her, you call them every time. They want to help you, but they can't help you if they don't know. So she would do it. Sometimes her boss would do it when he would show up at her work. And somebody would call for her. And, but she was getting good results because they would take him to jail. But then he'd bond right back out and start it again. So one night... She was getting off work, and this was late at night, and you know the town shuts down after a certain time, and you're lucky to see one car on Main Street. She was driving, and she looked back, and there he was behind her. <coughs> she was terrified, because even if he tried to bring her or over or whatever, there was probably nobody around at that time of night that would help her. So she started running red lights, and this, you know, here in Texas, started running red lights to get to the police station. She pulled in, screeched to a stop, he drove on by, and then she thought to herself, and again, that low self-esteem, I don't want to bother them again. They're, they're, gonna, they're tired of me at this police station. I should just go home. But she heard the voices of people that cared about her competing with her thoughts, saying, they want to go, please go in. We care, we care about you. Go in, they will help you. So she went in, the officer said, okay, um, I'll, I'll take that report, but why don't you let me follow you home? Let me make sure you get home safe. You know, part of her wanted to say, but you're too busy, but she did. So we followed her home. They looked around and outside, and just you know what they were at, were around. But that officer said, Do you want me to come inside here and just look and make sure before I leave? She said, Yes, come in, please, it's fine. So she comes in, and, and the officer's going from room to room, and then she hears the officer say, Step out of the closet. Her batterer had parked a few blocks away, broken in. When she was at the police station, he was figuring out how to get in her house. And if that officer had to come in, who knows what would have happened. But here's where the learned helplessness comes in. I saw Sharon. Oh, you know, most of us, you hear that and you think, oh, and you think, run, get out of there. You know, my instinct would be even if the police were there, I'd be out the door. I, she just, she said, I couldn't do anything. I just collapsed. I just sank down and it was... It was just that giving up of everything I tried, here he is. I can never escape this. So it doesn't always get better when people do it. Um, for safety, we want to remember when, when you're trying to encourage someone to leave, the most dangerous time is after a victim leaves. The most dangerous time. Um, usually it decreases after three months of separation and again after one year, but the victims who were killed in Texas who were killed six months after separation, usually there was something significant coming up, a, a court date. Uh, and that's when batterers, male or female, can think, this is it, they really are, this is, they're really going through with this, and that's when they can become their most desperate. In at least four cases, partners were killed in retaliation for either making police reports or seeking protective orders. 
So but there are no guarantees. We can think, well, why don't you call the police? Why don't you get a protective order? Um, when victims are threatened, if you do this, I will kill you. At the crisis center, we trust them because they know their offenders better than we do. And if they don't want to make a report, then we trust them on that. Uh, and they don't have to. Um, this is a case of Casey, who was a nurse and then went back to medical school and became a critical care anesthesiologist. She was murdered the day after she ended her relationship. And her friend that she called, apparently in my mind, was Wonder Woman. She called her friend Wonder Woman to come over. And when that friend arrived, the friend heard gunshots in the home and went in anyway and confronted the offender. And then the offender threatened to kill her and that she wrestled with him. He ended up shooting himself. And then her friend died. Um, Casey, this, the, the victim, died and lost all of her injuries the day after. This happens to professional people. To. It, it stretches across all religions, all socioeconomic classes, and backgrounds. Um, there's a danger assessment, and we'll just pass that out for, we use this at the crisis center, and it's something that sort of breaks through the, the, the denial that victims have about the seriousness of their relationship. This was developed by a nurse, and basically um, it's to try to determine who, which victims are at a greater risk of homicide. And the thing to remember, and I'm going to move on, is that victims who score an eight or higher are at a very grave risk of homicide. Um, and the other thing, women who are threatened or assaulted with a gun or other weapon were 20 times more likely than other abused women to be murdered. <laughs> so there are warning signs that we can see among the people we care about if they're revealing this to let us know they're at a much higher risk. A couple of statistics of the things I've been sharing with you. Um, 146 women killed in 2016. The victims' ages were from 15 years old to 92 years old. So it can happen even in the elderly population as well. The, the perpetrators' ages range from 15 to 90. And this bottom one, 24 other family members and friends were killed in those situations. And here's an example of that from Bastrop. Alejandro Martinez, 20, shot and killed his girlfriend, Erica, outside her home. He then shot and killed their son, age 3, as well as Erica's friend, Paula, age 20. He also shot and injured Paula's daughter, there below, and then he shot and killed himself. So, familicide, where a batterer um, kills their current or former partner, one or more of their children, and then kills themselves, is something that does occur and that happened eight times in Texas in 2016. The youngest man to commit it was 20 and the oldest was 90 years old. And that 90 year old man killed his 92 um, year old think, wife and her 74 year old daughter. Um, another example in Bastrop, that the first one I gave you was July. Two months later this, this happened. Um, Leroy Friedel fatally shot and killed his wife Jennifer and their three year old son and then shot and killed himself. How we can help, um, we do provide services to victims. There is no cost for any of our services to victims. We have an emergency family violence shelter. We have a 24-hour hotline. And if the victim won't call, but maybe you want to call and talk about how you can help a friend that might be in that situation, we would gladly talk to you as well. There are some exceptions to what we will keep confidential, just like schools and, and the general public. Um, if we have knowledge of child abuse, if we suspect that is occurring, we're required to report it. We're required to report, report elder abuse, that's age 65 or older, um, and abuse of disabled persons. Or we're not legally required, but we're ethically bound that if someone is a danger to themselves, if they were suicidal, if they are homicidal, we're going to alert authorities, we're going to warn a potential victim because that's our ethical duty to do so. So just to, to clarify, if a 40-year-old victim comes into our center and has been assaulted and is battered and has bruises, it's, it's up to her if she wants to make a police report. If a 40-year-old victim in a wheelchair comes into our center, that's a protected, vulnerable population, and we have to report that in our law. All right, we are just about done. Just some ways that you can help. Um, encourage encourage people to seek help, whether that's through a pastor, whether that's through the crisis center. If you know the perpetrator, you know, 
encourage them to seek help. Their lives will be so much better and happier and fulfilled and they will actually have lasting relationships if they will swallow their pride and address the behavior that they're engaging in against the partners. It's so important. And if you hear them say things that, that cause you to believe that they are a danger, pick up the phone and talk to law enforcement. We are a small enough town that, that they may, there may not be anything legally they can do based on what you're telling them, but they will certainly be able to keep a better lookout and keep us all safe. Um, please don't issue ultimatums to victims. If you don't leave him for this or that, that doesn't, it doesn't help. Just love them through it and keep giving them the message that no one, no one deserves to be abused. All right, can I answer any questions? Is there any way that law enforcement restrictions can be changed to where you're not living in two months of just because he's driving and has a knock on the door? I mean, that harm is right there.